to The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. Did a vessel of extraterrestrial origin touch down near a U.S. Air Force base in England over Christmas in 1980? Tonight, we'll meet several of those witnesses, including one who claims to have walked up to the landed craft and touched it. We'll also meet a UFO investigator who insists the evidence proves that a vessel of extraterrestrial origin touched down in Rendlesham Forest in 1980. We'll also meet a skeptic who insists there are numerous plausible explanations for this event, none of them which include a flying saucer piloted by an alien. Our mission is to investigate these claims and follow the truth wherever it may lead. It is time to redefine reality. Genetic enigma or a human alien hybrid. Is this possible technology can alter weather patterns created by the Engineered by the Illuminati. I'm here in Phoenix with Jim Penniston, U.S. Air Force retired staff sergeant at Royal Air Force Base in Bent Waters during the 1980 Rendlesham incident. Jim, welcome to the Conspiracy Show. Thanks for your time. Well, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. I want you to give me a quick thumbnail sketch or a timeline of what you saw, the date, where you were, and what your observations were. Yeah, I was working the uh, midnight shift on the 25th of December, uh, 1980. I was in charge of security for RAF Woodbridge, England. And uh, around uh, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, I was called uh, to go to the East Gate. I arrived there, and uh, Sergeant Stephens briefed me that uh, they had a, something going on in the woods. I looked out there. It appeared to be a dome of light, it looked like a fire. I said, well, you hear a crash? And he says, uh, no, Jim, it didn't crash at all. I said, well, did it land? And he goes, yeah, something like that. Uh, I went back to the gate shack. I called into my control centers. They're checking to see the radar, uh, to see if there was a tracking or anything like that. In a couple minutes, they come back online and they say, uh, we had an uh, unidentified bogey about 15 minutes ago, uh, lost contact over RF Woodbridge. We deployed quickly off base. It was only like 300 yards, and uh, there was like a bright uh, uh, a white light. A triangular craft appeared in front of us. It measured approximately nine feet long, triangular in shape, black glass looking, metal feel, but very, very smooth. And when I came around to the far side, I see there was uh, uh, some type of pictorial uh, glyphs on it. Um, and uh, I was actually hoping that it would say United States Air Force or NASA or something like that. It's a rainy, cold day here in Rendlesham Forest. We're just outside the old Woodbridge Air Force Base, and I'm here to meet Larry Warren, the original whistleblower of the Rendlesham Forest UFO incident. He's here to relive those strange events that happened over 30 years ago. I saw what I saw. I never saw anything in the air except the light come in, and then an object, something happened, and there was a structured object on the ground. drove down here and turned left, stopped, and then moved on foot through much like this. And there was no snow on the ground. And I mean, the, the forest was this all the way through. This is what you're going through in pitch black night, flashlights, radios going. And I still stand by and I'm not alone in it. There was something alive in association with it. It was just there. When you say it was there, you mean you felt a presence? No, I saw, you, it. You I, saw I, it. I saw it. Definitely three things. So. Inside the craft? Outside. Lieutenant Bonnie Tamplin kind of lost it a bit and uh, wouldn't come back out here. I'm here with Peter Robbins, co-author of Left at Eastgate, a first-hand account of the Rendlesham Forest UFO incident. Peter, thanks for joining me. My pleasure, Richard. Larry's story is truly remarkable. Some might say out of this world, as are all the, the witnesses. Stories. Indeed. Why did you believe him? Good question. I have to be a skeptic because I know this is real beyond a reasonable doubt from the work I've done. Whatever happened to him in that field and happened to him after with more terrestrial uh, sources controlled and ran his life. 
So what do you think they saw out there? I think they saw technology and a presence from parts unknown. These men's lives were changed forever. Uh, I'm sure some of them, most of them, would have rather just done what the service wanted them to do, which is forget about it. I'm here in southern Arizona at the Grasslands Observatory with James Magaha, retired U.S. Air Force pilot, astronomer, and skeptic. James, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. Welcome. Glad to be here. I want to talk to you about the Rendlesham Forest UFO incident. Basically, what happened was some lights were seen, and uh, the first night, the lights caused the airmen to want to go off base and investigate the lights. And uh, they took some equipment, they took a radiac meter and a starlight scope and some other things. Colonel Hall did a tape recording, a handheld cassette tape recording that night of what he was seeing, which I have a copy of, and it's very interesting to listen to the tape. This is 148, we're hearing very strange sounds out of the farmers burning our animals. It's very, very active, making an awful lot of noise. Okay, stop, stop. Hey, this is Erie. This is strange. And I could hear all the transmissions in real time that you hear on the whole audio tape. See it? The center spot. The one that really is in the center. It's slightly off center. It's right there. There it is, right there. Focused. Okay. Look at that spot number one to the starlight scope. A starlight scope is an image intensifier for low light and intensifies low light. It does not detect energy. It does not detect infrared. All it does is intensify light. Then he looks at the Orford Lighthouse, which he doesn't realize is the Orford Lighthouse. We are getting an indication of a heat source coming out of that center spot. You just saw a light yeah, there. Wait, 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 wait. Where? Right at this position here, straight ahead in between the tree. There it is again. And so it, it gives all this weird, bizarre looking, because he's looking at this incredibly bright object. People have argued he didn't see the lighthouse, but he's, he's looking straight at, he says what, he's looking at uh, an angle of 110 degrees. About 110 degrees, getting a rain of about four clicks. Yes, sir. Yeah, but, excuse me. No, I think it's something other than the ground. I think it's something that's... Some very large tree, right? We have found the first light bird we've seen. We're about 150 or 200 yards from the site. Everything else is just deathly calm. There is no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. I saw a yellow tinge in it too. Weird. He has a period of about five seconds, and of course, the Orford Lighthouse is a period of five seconds, and it's at 110 degrees from where he was. So either he was looking at the lighthouse or he's looking at a UFO with a flashing light with five seconds of hovering directly above the lighthouse. What other possible explanation could there be aside from the Orford Ness Lighthouse? Oh, well, it, when you get in the explanation, it, is quite, it get, becomes quite complicated. Let's talk about the first night when the airmen went out. They see lights, they see various lights. They probably saw the Orford Lighthouse, but they saw something else. They saw something with a blue bank of lights, with a, a, a bright light on top of it and some other things. And what is not widely publicized is that somebody called the British police. And there was a British police car driving around out there on the farm roads. And very likely they were seeing the flashing strobe lights of this police car because it has a bank of blue lights on top of it. But once they got out there with the police car and the Orphan Lighthouse, that's probably what they saw. They never got close to it in their reports, and they were ordered to come back to base. 
The second night they go out and they don't see anything initially. And then of course, somebody says they see a light. And then they call Halt who was at a party and Halt decides to organize a team and go out. And then all of a sudden, they see this flashing light, which is the Orphan Lighthouse. And then at some point, Hall looks up at the sky and about 10 degrees off the horizon in the north and the south, he sees three bright objects. And uh, they're just stationary objects. And then he says they look like they're shooting off beams or dancing and so forth. And all they are is stars. It's the biggest insult in the world. We're highly trained, some even more trained than others, but we all knew that here we were. They don't put idiots out here. Colonel Halt, when this happened, uh, again, a respected military personage, uh, retired 12 years later as a full colonel. This hurt his career, and that's not conjecture or guesswork. He told us. When they retraced their steps, lo and behold, they end up where Halt says nothing ever happened. Seems everything happened there. Interesting. These men's lives were changed forever. Uh, I'm sure some of them, most of them, would have rather just done what the service wanted them to do, which is just forget about it. Well, a guy, actually, a guy that's my side said, what, happened, what would happen if we talked about it? The people are already talking. They said like this, the guy said, with a smile, bullets are cheap. Walk me through the, the period that begins with your debriefing and the threats that were made against you. Well, we came off. We were, we came off uh, duty. I went immediately back to my room, my dorm room. So the next thing I know is that um, I get a note under my door, and they said. I had to go out to the chief of security police's office. And uh, that afternoon, they were debriefed. We're convinced it was disinformation, which is not a lie. It is a very skillful mixture of truth and fiction to produce a certain result. I'm convinced in this case to scare the hell out of the men involved. Well, a guy, actually, a guy to my side said, what, hap what would happen if we talked about it? The people were already They said like this, the guy said, with a smile, bullets are cheap. You know, there's this idea that somehow people can be threatened and all kinds of stuff. I, in all my career in the Air Force, I never saw anybody threatened. Were you taken to an underground base and debriefed? I think that was narco-hypnosis. I was taken to something subterranean. Uh, I do believe they exist on the base. I think for me that's very important. He was missing for, my understanding is between 24, 36 hours. Men who asked where he was were told he was on a leave. Uh, halt has always said that Larry was meddled with. Yes, he was. So were all of the men. Is there an underground complex there? I'm convinced there is. We signed pre-written statements saying we were off duty, and we had a sign. I said, that's not true. And we saw some lights, we were off duty. But we had no you sign, you know, that's what we had to do. Larry continued to inquire quietly on his own. I think was identified as a potential problem, so much so that at a certain point he realized it was probably prudent to leave the service. We had the highest rate of suicide in NATO on that base. After? After. Event. It was a captain who hung himself. It was, um, you know, you don't hear any of these officers talk about it because they're riding the pension wave, you know. The worst element was the government you were serving wasn't what you were serving, and there was a dark, dark element there. Your, your world is not the world you live in. You know it every day. The guy working next to you probably doesn't. And you sit there and you go, oh, I know things you definitely don't know. Larry outed everyone. And that broke the story ultimately in England. He went on to become the whistleblower. And I think back then they said, well, you know, people say certain things in 1981 society. No, you'd be laughed, uh, you know, you're a village idiot. It's not that way anymore. You know, people are very open-minded. People are more open to say, well, whereas they would have said, oh, crazy. Nowadays they go, well, maybe I'll tell you about something I saw. And then the other witnesses started to come forward years later, and it's now history. James Penniston uh, claimed that he went up to this craft. It had landed. He walked around it. He touched it. What do you make of uh, his account? 
but I'm highly skeptical of that. He now claims he touched it, and recently claimed he's getting some kind of binary download to his brain. I was like blinded by, uh, mentally blinded, uh, where I couldn't see, and all I could see is like ones and zeros flashing in my head, to the point where I couldn't see what was in front of me. As it dissipated, takes off up to treetop level. When the craft lifted off, there was no noise. There was no air displacement, which was strange. It momentarily uh, uh, stops, turns, and is gone in the blink of an eye. Since then, you know, I, I, have, I've, I gave that question to people uh, you know, that are in the know. They said, well, a blink of an eye would equate to 5,000 miles an hour. So that's pretty fast. At what point, Jim, did you start writing the ones and zeros, the binary code that you received in a flash? The following day, the 27th, when I woke up, I woke up early, I woke up at like four in the morning. And I mean, I was beside myself over what happened the day before, wondering just how real everything was. If you look at his original report, all he says is he saw lights, uh, the lights never got close to him. He says the lights went, moved away from him. He never touched anything. What he said in his official signed report is not what he's saying now. And you have to wonder, what does that mean? To go ahead and report that to anybody or back in the base would just be ludicrous. That I would I would have got relieved of duty. Um, so I never said nothing. And I got these ones and zeros going. I really thought I was sort of losing it, you know. So I started writing it down in the notebook. and. When I did that, it felt better. I thought it was all going to be uh, just gibberish. I really did. Then I get uh, the information back, and it finds out it's, it's actually it has meaning, and there's words, and a message. And the, the gist of that message was what? The general meaning of the, the message was that uh, it was a probe, and it was here for exploration of humanity. And, uh, and it was uh, time-related with the fourth coordinate, meaning that's a time-related code. And uh, so the uh, message indicated that this was from time travelers. The question here is what really happened, not uh, what they think happened. And what they're saying now certainly does not match their reports at the time. How do you feel about this whole incident three decades later? Are you? still passionate about what happened? We have questions. You know, that most likely are never going to get answered. A lot of the information is sitting in the archives that, you know, with the United States. I mean, that's going to remain classified, I'm sure. Talk to me about what this has cost you coming forward. Um, what does it cost? Uh, a couple marriages. Um, a couple career directions could have been good, probably. Oh, a million, a million things, you know. I mean, your worldview is never going to be the same. The other witnesses and I have talked, and we think that we're just going to have to live with it. I don't think we're ever going to have the full answers on Rendlesham. I think it's going to be uh, 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 not in our lifetime, anyway. It's part of you wish it never happened. I was asked a long time ago a very good question. They said, if you could change one thing about the Rendlesham Forest incident, what would it be? What one thing would it be? And I said, well, that's easy. I says, on the 24th of December, when they asked me if I wanted to work the Christmas schedule or the New Year's schedule, I would have said, I want to work the New Year's schedule. That's the only thing I would have, I t that, was, that was a six second, maybe seven second decision that changed my whole life. It should be noted that neither Jim Penniston or Larry Warren, the two witnesses I talked to, have ever referred to what they saw as a UFO or alien spacecraft. Larry Warren is an incredibly sincere and likable individual. He's paid dearly for talking openly about what he saw over 30 years ago. Two broken marriages, ridicule and scorn by his peers in the media. Why would he keep putting himself out there? He certainly hasn't profited from all this. I believe something happened to him, something nefarious. I believe whatever he saw resulted in his being interrogated, perhaps drugged, maybe even brainwashed. I spend far less time with Jim Penniston, but he too strikes me as a likable, honest person. But as of this moment, I can't honestly sit here and tell you that I believe he received a binary code message from time travelers. Yes, he seems to be a personable person, but you can never get inside somebody's head. I believe 
he believes he encountered something strange in the woods back in 1980. But perhaps his mind was tampered with too. The way the human brain works is quite complicated, and, and confabulation can be all over the place. People can be outright lying in confabulation, or they can be telling what they really think is the truth, but has nothing to do with reality. The question here is what really happened, not uh, what they think happened. And what they're saying now certainly does not match their reports at the time. I'm not ready to call Rendlesham Britain's Roswell just yet. But something strange happened in the woods back in December of 1980. Something that affected a number of U.S. Air Force men in a profound and negative way. And that is worthy of further investigation, UFOs or not. And now, I'd like to know what you think. You can contact us here at The Conspiracy Show through our website, www.theconspiracyshow.com. In the meantime, don't be afraid. Move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home. Good night.